Hello and welcome to Capital Ideas TV. I'm Mark Bunting. Anyone following the cannabis investment landscape has probably seen some variation of this chart. It's the presumed growth of the marijuana market in the U.S., courtesy of Accrell Capital. If things go relatively as planned, cannabis is going to be worth some serious coin within the next decade or so. The analysts at Accrell see business really starting to boom after 2020. That's when they presume the federal government will finally give the go-ahead to legalize marijuana. By 2029, we could be looking at a $100 billion market that counts more than 50 million consumers. Cannabis may be popular, but that doesn't mean all cannabis products are created equal. The winners and losers in this competitive market will be the ones who can predict consumer preferences. Early signs suggest it's extracts and concentrates like cannabis oils, resins, and waxes that will come out on top. Here's a look at sales trends in Oregon where cannabis was legalized in 2016. The growth in concentrates soared 71% last year, handily beating out dried flour. The strongest seller was vaporizers, which pulled in roughly two-thirds of the concentrates market. But some other hot items like shatter and oils are rising quickly in popularity as well. Oregon is where Halo Labs calls home. The company is a top manufacturer of cannabis extracts and concentrates in the state, with more than 20% share of the wholesale market. It also generated more than $10 million in sales last year. But Halo Labs has bigger ambitions than the Beaver State. It's opening up facilities in Nevada and California and has struck a joint venture in Canada as well. CEO Kieran Sadu explains how he intends to make Halo Labs a standout among customers across North America and beyond. Kieran, tell us about your extraction techniques and isolation techniques at, at Halo Labs and what makes them different and superior, as you think. Um, we looked at different processes to make the oil stable. So, for instance, um, we, add certain, we add certain stabilizers that are completely natural. So, whether the oil is in 120 degrees or whether the oil is in a colder temperature, we try to maintain viscosity. Um, the other thing we do is we have proprietary terpene formulations or black boxes of terpenes. Um, that give us certain flavors and certain profiles, but also add stability to the oil. And uh, it could go on and on, but we have a lot of incremental um, proprietary trade secrets that we've developed over the years, and we continually have to innovate. Because, for instance, we were the first ones to use um, centrifuges, high-speed centrifuges, which are used to separate blood post-winterization to get all the uh, contaminants and uh, roughage out of the oil. Uh, and now that's been duplicated by many different people who operate in a CGMP environment. So your techniques, is that your main differentiator uh, compared to other companies or, or is there more? No, there's, there's a lot more to it. So effectively, the management team has worked together in the space um, in one form or another, be it at Golden Leaf or be it at Namaste, where Philip is CFO and I'm still chairman of the audit committee, for a long period of time. And we're all blue chip people. I mean, Philip was a partner at Goldman Sachs. I myself went to Wharton and have been a successful entrepreneur in my undergraduate degree from Brown. And Andreas was a um, star executive at Walmart. And we know each other and we come from blue chip pedigrees. And we've worked together in the marijuana space, particularly in oils and concentrates, since 2013. And five years is an eternity in this space. So A, it's the team. B, it's our techniques. And then C, it's, it's also our zeal, meaning that we keep focus on oil and concentrates. We don't Many people in marijuana are aggregating multiple assets and acquiring multiple end-to-end -end, um, businesses, but you don't see that often in, in business. You know, people have to specialize in different area. Either you specialize in cultivation, you specialize in manufacturing, you specialize in distribution, or you specialize in dispensing. But to try to manage the whole gamut and grow a company is very, very hard. And I don't know in the long run if it's sustainable. Now, currently, uh, you specialize in Oregon. We'll talk about Nevada and California in a while, but you have about 20% of the uh, Oregon extractions market. So, 
Uh, tell us about that and, and, and how do you go about uh, building that? Well, you know, I, I say if you can make it in Oregon, you can make it anywhere. Oregon is the toughest market because it's a, it's a free market. So there are probably active over 100 extractors in Oregon that we compete with. And it's just that, again, it take, taking what we just discussed, which is our background, our knowledge and know-how, along with our extraction techniques, has allowed us to be successful. Also, we have a very strong marketing strategy where we actually white label. Many um, extractors will not white label. Many of them just want to promote their own brands. Um, our first and foremost focus is, again, being manufacturing centric, is to is to put push grams out the door. And we've pushed 2.5 million grams since our inception since April of 2016. And uh, so white label is very important and it's also very important in the fact that from a regulatory standpoint we don't know where things are going to go especially with brands so will it be you know dispensaries that are the big brands will it be the farms that are the big brands we really don't know so when the one thing i can tell you about the marijuana business is nothing is certain <laughs> and so white label also gives us tremendous flexibility and then with our own brands, we have an opening price point strategy. So for instance, we have very high-end distillate vape cartridges with Exhale, but we make sure that in that segment of the market, we're positioned lower than any of our competitors. In the middle range, we have Hush. Again, we make sure that we're positioned. So when a consumer comes into a dispensary and they want to purchase a product, and they want to try. They want to try for the product they want at the lowest possible price point. If they try and they're happy, they repeat. And so that's how we get brand stickiness. Approximately 50,000 individual medical patients or recreational users use our product every month in Oregon. Okay, so that's Oregon. Let's move along to Nevada. You've already set up shop there. You're close to doing the same thing in California. So what kind of projections can you give us in terms of production and revenue from those two states? Well, Nevada's an interesting market. Um, it's the opposite of Oregon <laughs> in the sense that N Nevada has a finite number of licenses they've given out. Uh, we have a production license there that we're operating under. We're acquiring that license. We're acquiring a cultivation license in Nevada, and we are acquiring a distribution license, and those are under binding LOI. And Nevada, you have actually an undersupply. So the constraint in Nevada is not so much um, the demand side, but it's the supply side of the equation. And so we've been fortunate to partner with some successful, um, with, some, with some suppliers. Um, we're bringing in right now raw oil. We're formulating it to, again, our proprietary standards and selling it. Inevitably, we will be cultivating in Nevada and more cultivation will come online, which will allow us to do end-to-end -end extraction. Uh, so I would hope that Nevada by the first quarter of this year will be doing equal to Oregon. Um, and and I, I'm fairly confident that we'll get there. And then California, a huge state, right. bigger than Canada. California is yeah, at least 30% larger than Canada. And you can probably fit the entire population of Oregon easily within Los Angeles County, um, and not to include all of Southern California. So in, in practice in California, we should be doing substantially more revenues. Um, we're just now um, completing our first facility in Cathedral City, which is a Type 7 manufacturing facility. We already have a contract for all the oil we can produce, um, which we think will be uh, about 70,000 grams a week. Uh, w all of that is already contracted at a 40% lock margin. We already have contracted supply. So in California, for us to do, to be successful, uh, we need to execute, and we're very good at executing. And if we execute, then we have a locked in probably, you know, I would, I would have to say four million of revenue a month, and I hope to achieve that in California um, by November. 
So in a perfect world, you know, we would have about five million of revenue by November and growing probably to six to seven million in Q, Q1. And then looking out to uh, 2019, Kieran, you're looking at tripling Halo Labs revenue to nearly 90 million. So Correct. is that all about execution? And, and second part of that question is, what kind of margins are you looking at? Okay. We are a rollout. We are a heads down. We have a certain culture that we try to impose and we roll out. So if we execute, if we continue to execute and the market continues to grow, um, we can easily achieve those numbers. I th would think that the only thing we would have to do next year is add Northern California. And we're already in discussions about adding a facility in Northern California, and again, white label contracting with key dispensaries in Northern California. If we add that unit and the other units grow, that number is actually a conservative number because we would enter the year with probably 60 to 70 million run rate. So we'd just have to increase it by another 20.